welcome back to Public Sector Voices with Emily Rogers. With us today, we have Lord Robert Kerslake. He's been listed as one of the most influential people in the public sector, thanks to his services to local government that span from council chief executive to president of the local government association and life peer in the House of Commons. Hi, Bob. Thanks for being on Public Sector Voices. How have you found the past few months? Very weird, to be honest with you. Uh, having to adapt to a completely different way of working, uh, everything being done by uh, Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams, rarely going out of the house. Uh, and I guess having to organise uh, work in a different way, I suppose. Um, so uh, very different. But managing still to get things done, that's the interesting thing. Yeah, that's the main um, thing. Fortunate to be able to deliver on what we have to do. Definitely. So you've got a really extensive view of the public sector. How would you describe the current landscape in like a couple of words? Oh, I think uh, there's been huge adaptability to the change circumstances. We should uh, pay immense tribute, really. Not you know, Obviously, hospitals and in the NHS people have seen, but I think local government should be recognised for the extraordinary efforts they've uh, made to keep you know, refuse being collected, uh, to keep uh, essential services going, to provide the support and protection to those who are most vulnerable. So, you know, a fantastically uh, adaptable set of services we've had in the last uh, period. But, and there is a but, um, some massive pressures, uh, financial pressures are building in a whole range of institutions, particularly local government, but also in our theatres and universities and other bodies. And I think um, alongside that, some uh, you know, huge questions raised about uh, handling here, particularly in terms of things like social care. So in terms of issues, that combination of both adaptability and agility in, in extraordinary circumstances, but also considerable anxiety about the future, I think. Because earlier in the year, you launched the UK 2070 Commission, looking at things yeah. like regional inequalities. And, you know, before we go, go into that and how things might have been affected because of the current situation, can you give us a bit of background on it kind of before the crisis? Yes. I mean, what we found in our UK 2070 report, um, and when we were uh, either very uh, skillful or fortunate in managing to launch it before coronavirus became mm. the dominating issue was that essentially the UK is one of the most unequal countries uh, in the developed world, if not the most unequal, that uh, this was moving in the wrong direction. We were becoming more unequal, not less. And if we did nothing about it, that gap would further grow. Now, we called it rebalancing, but of course... Uh, it also became a strong theme of the new government, uh, rebadged as levelling up. Mm. And uh, what we argued in our report was that if the government was serious about that, then they would need to, uh, as we said, go big or go home. They would need to have a comprehensive, uh, large-scale and long-term plan. And crucially, they would need to uh, devolve uh, power to places uh, and localities. Um, so that was our message. We had a 10-point action plan in the report. And then, of course, coronavirus uh, came. And where has it left us? Well, it's had, as everybody will know, a huge health impact and a huge economic impact. Yeah. And that economic impact has not been evenly felt. We know that uh, those who are on lower incomes, those who are young people in particular, have been very hard hit. We've seen claimant count uh, absolutely uh, shooting up uh, and I think there's reasonable evidence suggest that it will have very severe impacts on certain industries as well and typically um, those that are uh, more likely to be uh, take making redundancies in these circumstances and we heard uh, recently of more of those happening. Furloughing has helped in the short term, but as it's, I think, becoming increasingly clear that this is more like a Nike swoosh than a, a V-shaped pattern here, mm. um, and it could end up being you know, a W in terms of recovery. Industries and firms are stepping back and saying, actually, even with furloughing, we're now going to make some radical changes in how we work. So uh, it's going to be a pretty difficult time. 
uh, I still think the agenda, though, is crucially important uh, that we identified. Yeah, and, and going back to what you were saying before, why do you think um, the UK is so centralised as opposed to other countries? Uh, it's a good question why we're so centralised as a country. I think the truth is that we've, um, uh, we're quite a compact country in geographically, historically, uh, London has dominated. And I think over time, uh, any efforts to kind of devolve have often um, gone in one step forward and two steps back. And so we've got into a pattern of doing things that I would call a kind of overloaded centre huge amounts of power and responsibility at the centre and disempowered places. Um, and so it's just been a, a gradual erosion of local autonomy, both financially and in terms of their powers. And uh, once you lose it, it's terribly hard to get it back. And only in very recent times, through things like devolution deals, have we seen uh, any reversal of that process, actually. And it's still got a long way to go, in my view. And I think... Uh, one of the interesting questions, is, which is worth picking up here, is that uh, what we're now into is a period of enormous uncertainty um, about how, our, how we deal with the health issues, how we deal with the economic issues. Of course, still in the background is Brexit and how that plays out. And in that situation of uncertainty, it makes uh, sense to... Uh, allow local places to lead on things uh, and give them the power uh, to do things and try things out. Not all of them will work, but at the moment, trying to do all of the planning in a centralised way nationally is is really extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible. And it just reinforces the importance of of devolution, in my view, uh, in these current times. Definitely. And what what out of interest, what was the response to the whole go big or go home statement? Um, pretty powerful, really. We got a huge amount of response from uh, from uh, local government and from other kind of uh, policy and other think tanks. Mm. And I think inside government, a recognition of what we were saying. We did meet with ministers uh, at the time of publication, uh, and they re I think they both understood that we were absolutely on the right set of issues. Um, yeah. Uh, I would say they were in the throes of thinking about how they might take forward the levelling up agenda, and then coronavirus came and you know blew almost everything out of the uh, out of the water really in those terms. Uh, and I guess the challenge will be now to restart uh, that agenda of, of levelling up in a, in the face of the fact that things, if anything, will have been moved backwards rather than forwards by this by this. Uh, pandemic that we've had to deal with so a fair amount of um i think acknowledgement of the issues alignment of argument if you like uh, there might be differences of emphasis but very much in the same space in my conversations uh, about this um and i desperately hope that we can uh restore confidence in the economy and actually restore confidence in our ability to uh, plan and deliver change yeah, because for me, the the phrase "go big or go home" it rings of a group of people who are frustrated and they've kind of had enough. Is that the kind of message that you think was coming across? I think what I think what we were trying to say was, I mean, there is frustration there, I should say, but mm -hmm. I think what we were trying to say is, if you're going to have this ambition of leveling up, mm -hmm. then don't uh, raise expectations unless you un intend to underpin it. Yeah by a big uh, ambitious program that's really what we were saying mm. and they're often these cross-cutting uh, long game ambitious programs are the thing that government has typically struggled with in the past so we were really saying it would be almost do more harm than good if you were to kind of say we're getting behind leveling up you know great news yeah. and then really what comes along is is more short-term, as I called it, pea shooter policies. Because I, it particularly resonated with me, and I thought it was really important. And that's why I've been following the the report. I'm from Blackpool, so it's a town that often gets kind of well, left behind indeed. in that regard. Yes, absolutely. It's got many of the characteristics we've talked about uh, uh, to deal with there. And I think it's worth saying that um, some people say, "Is this only about towns, or is it about cities?" The truth is, it's got to be towns and cities. Yeah. Um, working together, really, you you won't uh, 
resolve all the issues in towns within those towns themselves. They're, it's about creating connected economies and powerful drivers of growth, both uh, in cities and, and in towns. The economic health, notwithstanding some uh, significant improvements in places like Manchester, of our main cities outside London is still got uh, still some way behind uh, where it needs to be really. Only Bristol has a GDP above the national average, so there's a, a big job to be done. And that might have something to do with its proximity to London. <laughs> well, of course, of yeah. course, yes. So now the world has obviously changed dramatically. What effect do you think this will have on local communities and you know, particularly those ones that are experiencing this disparity in, fu in funding compared to the South? Uh, it's a good question as to how this will play out and what will be the um, drivers of change. I think one of the things that will happen is that the issue of, of, let's call it security or safety, if you like, will go up the agenda. So, you know, we all know about prosperity. We all know about inclusion. I think we're going to now see people wanting to be assured about, um, you know, are they in a secure and safe place? And that means a bigger emphasis on what are, some people have called the foundational uh, economy, those basic services around health and care. Uh, I think people will expect a, a government to reassure them that that is properly funded and able to withstand a future shock like the one we've uh, just had. Mm. I think the second feature of what we're going to see is um, in places now are already working on what their economic renewal plan is going to be. Uh, how are they going to get their local economies back on a, a sound footing? Um, and they will want government to get behind that and, yeah. and not, not hold it up, if you like. They'll want them to give them the support needed, which is kind of brings me on to the third thing, really, of uh, finance. As I said really right at the start of this uh, interview, um, this uh, pandemic and the economic uh, consequences of it have knocked the stuffing out of uh, the finances of many of our local services. Um, the ticket, local government have had extra costs, but crucially they've lost income as well. Uh, I chair Sheffield Theatres, which has had 80, over 85% of its income disappear overnight. Um, and how the government responds to that, how it uh, thinks about this issue. Of course, it's faced some big new debts mm. uh, from responding to this. But the worst thing of all they could do is to fail to give the financial support um, to local services to ensure that they can uh, build the recovery. Yeah, I mean, because some, someone like me, I don't really understand the inner workings of the Treasury. So where will that money come from? Well, the truth is um, government are going to have to borrow and they're going to have to pay it off over quite a long period of time. I think um, cutting uh, expenditure has been ruled out by the Prime Minister, quite rightly in my view. Yeah. And I doubt if there's going to be much appetite for big rises in taxes. So we're going to have a major debt that will be held and paid over off over a considerable period. And that is, there have been other occasions where that's happened, of course, in wars and other situations. Um, so they'll simply have to hold it as debt. The good news at the moment is interest rates are low in those terms. Um, but they, they can't, in my view, think that they're going to recover that uh, additional debt that's been created through coronavirus. It's going to have to be to use the phrase, kind of ring-fenced and dealt with in its own terms. Yeah. So is the problems within local local government, is it all financial or is there other things that they need to worry about? Uh, I think it's it's financial, but I think there's a number of stages they're going to need to work through. Um, and I was talking to a colleague about this uh, recently. I mean, we're currently in the response phase. Mm -hmm. um, the next phase is going to be restart. Uh, by that I mean remobilising of services, housing, you know, leisure, and so on, and that will need some planning. It's not obvious at the moment how, for example, we get our theatres open again and when we get them open again. Mm. Um, there's a third phase which is going to be recovery. How do we restore the economy? But then there's a fourth phase which is renewal. How do we move, in a sense, going back to the start of this conversation? 
uh, how do we move beyond where we were when uh, coronavirus hit us and mm. um, transform our uh, local economies uh, and strengthen them? So they've got a whole series of things they need to do. Um, finance underpins it, but it's not the only issue. Uh, it will be about very kind of careful planning and, and very in, uh, good leadership across the range of local services in, in, in local areas. So this that you're talking about, the things, you know, the recovery, the response, the renewal, do you think these yeah. all should be decided on, on a local level and like different different things for different areas? I think as much as possible should be done at a local level. There will be some things where there has to be a, a national expectation of how things are done um, and where we'll have to take um, the advice of public health experts. But we do know that um, the impact of geographically of coronavirus is not the same everywhere. We know that urban areas typically have uh, been more uh, strongly hit than others. We know that uh, tracing and tracking is going to be different in different places and crucially that agenda needs to be locally led. So yes, I think uh, so far as possible we should uh, uh, take a, a local approach to this but there will be areas where government have to set the direction of travel. Yeah, because I think a lot of the success will come through trust and people are probably more inclined to trust their local councillors than central government. They are. I think there's plenty of evidence to support that. It's also more likely that local councils will be able to tune the um, policies to suit local circumstances um, yeah. you know, on things like leisure services and, and so on. I think it's also worth saying that allowing local variation would also help us learn what works best. You know, I think... Uh, some variation, learning and then adapting is going to be necessary. Yeah, and it's also a good way to discover new new kind of ideas that then they can then be shared across the country. Yeah, exactly that point, really, rather than central diktat. Again, we've seen some of these tensions play out on the return of schools, of course, mm, yeah, which haven't lot, yet, as we speak, been resolved. A lot of people have turned around and said, well, you know, not in my town. <laughs> Not in my town, exactly right. But I think had there been, they've also said, by the way, some of them that they weren't they weren't properly engaged in the conversation before the announcements were made. And I think um, if there has to be, I know what it's like. The temptation at central government level is to sort out what you think the answer is and then launch it on an unsuspected world. Mm. Uh, in these circumstances, there has to be engagement, collaboration, discussion before decisions are announced. Definitely, because I guess there'll be different concentration of areas where there might be, for example, more key workers, so that means there's more people in schools at the moment already. Yeah, it will vary hugely in different parts of the country. Um, and uh, you're right. And, and also, I think you're unlikely, if you're doing it nationally, to pick up all the kind of nuances, if you like, the, mm. the detail that's so crucial to getting this right. Definitely. And I mean, a recent example of the kind of disparity that was spoken about would be the, the transport, the 1.6 billion for transport for London, kind of pushing active travel. Um, and it seems like a lot of northern leaders are becoming you know, less tolerant of that and more outspoken and, and more frustrated on the situation. Have you found this as well? Yeah, well, Andy Burnham has been quite uh, vocal. I mean, there's an imbalance in the investment in transport infrastructure between London and and the rest of the country already. Um, and that really was part of our levelling up agenda. We argue for a connectivity revolution that connected cities, uh, city regions, uh, and indeed beyond city regions to uh, the, the disadvantaged towns. So we need a big programme to level up on transport anyway. I think they were right to put money into London Transport. It was necessary, but... Mm -hmm. I think doing that without having at the same time had a conversation about the transport challenges in in other places was you know uh, you know a mistake bluntly I think they should have tried to do something that looked at the issues in in, in both sets of places you know buses for example um, you know what could they have done there um, at local level so I think uh, I can understand the frustration of people like Andy Burnham. I don't think, as I say, it was the wrong decision to put money in. Indeed, it's nowhere near enough yeah. uh, for London's uh, needs. 
but they must uh, must must work uh, alongside that with the the combined authorities, the city mayors, and uh, have answers for their challenges as well. Definitely, and kind of staying on transport and the whole issue of connectivity. Where does this, in your opinion, where does this leave HS2? I think the need for HS2, in my view, still stands not simply to get faster travel between cities, but because it's part of a, a renewal of the transport infrastructure in this country uh, yeah. and, and part of that connectivity revolution. So I, I and I think if we were to stop now doing that, we would have a wasted inordinate amounts of money and b missed an opportunity to deliver what you know many other countries have already delivered, you know, um, a, a reformed and upgraded transport network. So I hope they will go ahead and I hope they will commit to doing the whole scheme. They may need to look at the ordering of when things are done. Um, they may want to look but more at how it connects with uh, travel between cities. So all of that makes a lot of sense, I think. But I really hope that they don't um, step back from the uh, ambition to deliver a new network in this country. Yeah, because arguably it's about more than just transport. It's also kind of promoting a lot of investment in just being able to travel a bit quicker. I think it's absolutely that. Uh, it would never should have been. In a way, the name was probably the most uh, problematic thing of uh, HS2. Mm. Uh, it was about um, renewal of the transport infrastructure in order to promote economic renewal. But you won't get that unless you not only do HS2, but the connectivity, you know, the Northern Powerhouse Rail and improved bus services. You've got to transform the whole network. This is the point, really. Definitely. And in many ways, yes, just to, is almost the spine of that new network um, here. And I think once is, if we can progress it, and it, it has had its problems, we all know that, in terms of managing costs and clarity about timetables, but that shouldn't be the, a reason for not doing it. Yeah. And I feel like you're the man to ask this with your experience and all of the kind of work that you've put into the to the UK 2017 and things like that. But how then specifically are towns and cities across the UK going to level up? Obviously, it's financial, but how is it? How are they going to exceed the expectations going forward? Gosh, that's a big question. Um, my, and I hope we try to answer it in our in our final report with the 10 point action plan, and we in that plan um, talked about the need to work um, across a range of issues. So is it about skills? Yes. Is it about infrastructure? Yes. Is it about local economic growth and local leadership? Yes. And so on. You know, It's all of the above. Uh, and so the only way I think we will make sustainable progress is if government both enables action locally to happen and itself has a coordinated, determined, long-term effort to rebalance. Uh, that's the only way I think it will happen, which touches on all the issues, transport, ed uh, education and skills, local growth, uh, research and development. All of these need to be taken forward uh, in a joined-up way if you're going to really make life genuinely different in our towns. Well, what advice then would you give to um, to local authorities and councillors who obviously are up against it right now? Um, what would you tell them to kind of get them through? Well, gosh, I think, first of all, they obviously you need to work together through the Local Government Association and others to forcefully make the case to government that they cannot and must not shortchange them uh, on the cost of this uh, uh, emergency, really, of dealing with this emergency. Um, they've argued, I think, the figure is 10 billion gap. Um, mm. That that needs to be addressed. So that's number one, uh, because if that isn't done, nothing else will follow. Secondly, I think um, they've got to press for a resolution of the uh, health and, and and care issues, the integration of these two services. You know, we've learned a lot through this pandemic about how, in a crisis, you know, the NHS has come ahead. And our social care has suffered, really. I think we have to be honest about that. Yeah. Um, and so that agenda needs to be reignited with urgency, I think. Um, the third thing is uh, to do what I think a lot of them are doing, which is to develop their own kind of local economic recovery plans. And then 
ask government to give them the support towards delivering that. Um, they can do quite a lot themselves, and I think they will do. But I think the sort of leadership shown by Mayor Dan Jarvis, where he's convened uh, a group of organisations, universities, hospitals and others across South Yorkshire to develop a, a, a recovery plan. I know other mayors have done this, Andy Street and others. Um, is, is the sort of thing that needs to happen, actually. Yeah, I was going to um, ask what you would put into your um, recovery plan, but it's that kind of thing, oh, that kind of collaboration. It's First of all, I would put in the plan collaboration, and, and I would absolutely look at how we can restore the jobs market yeah. um, so that those who are losing jobs at the moment can get back into work quickly. I worry a lot about economic scarring, people being out of work for a long period. So it's those, it's all of that, and then it's asking each institution, what can they contribute towards delivering this plan? Brilliant. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to speak to us today. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Some really great insight there from Lord Kerslake. Join us on next week's episode. We have Councillor Nick Forbes, who is leader of Newcastle City Council. I'll see you then.